Today, the topic that I'm asked to talk on is the obstacles and challenges of the OSA vis a vis the MACC. Indeed, for me, that itself is already a real challenge for the simple reason that uh, as a public officer, I am bound by the public officer's conduct and disciplinary regulations which forbids a government officer, whether written, oral or through other means from making public statements or comments that is deemed detrimental or critical to government policies, programs or decisions. So the cashier is how do I make myself heard without talking? And how to speak without hurting? Okay. I believe the speakers before me has uh, dwelt on the Official Secret Act uh, 1972. As we know, this is an act that seeks to protect official secrets from unauthorized release. The essence of the act is, of course, that uh, Official government information is not to be received, retained, or released without prior authorization. Civil servants are forbid from diverging information. The effect is that any employee of the government, whether by virtue of his office or employment, is in possession of documents, information, considered to be secret, and as such ought to be kept secret, who without authorization disclose such information, commits an offence. The Act also makes it an offence for unauthorised person, general members of the public, who have in possession or control official secrets whether they retain it, use it, communicate it, or fail to take reasonable care of such secret. You see, under the law, when you receive unauthorized information, no matter how innocently, you are obligated under the law to report it to the police, diverge your sources, surrender the material if you reasonably believe it to be an official secret, thus the law imposes an obligation to all persons, not only public servants, to protect government secrets to unauthorized persons. The information remains confidential, even if confidentiality has been broken by, down by has been broken by others. For instance, information appearing in the internet, or information already known to the general public and is already in the public domain as long as the documents or information contain the word secret, it will remain so until the government decides otherwise. Now, various views has been presented that the OSA hinders transparency of government's decision and their accountability to the people as the OSA protects government information absolutely. It is said that information belong to the people. They have a right to know unless there is a good reason for them not to. Or it is safe, it is not safe to disclose. It is stating the obvious when we say access to information helps to make public authorities accountable for their actions, allows public debate to be better informed. It is an important check and balance mechanism. Unnecessary secrecy leads to arrogance in governance and defective decision making. Disclosure can also improve public confidence and trust when the government is seen to be more open. Take for instance, the public disclosure of assets by elected members of the legislative that is practiced in some countries. 
there, there will always be argument that uh, this disclosure infringes individual rights. But in essence, public disclosure of assets is not about using it against them to monitor their assets, investigate their family wealth, or to check wrongdoings. Instead, why don't we look at public disclosure of assets uh, as something about improving public integrity, maintaining the confidence of citizens in political institutions? The goal is to provide, to promote good values underlying the service of the elected members and the public interest they serve and how they fulfill those values and serve those public interests. In UK, for instance, disclosure is to provide information to the public so that acts that can be reasonably thought by others to be influenced by personal interests or private interests can be reduced. That is, the public knows what is going on. Now, from the anti-corruption perspective, Robert Kligat, an anti-corruption expert, has gone on to explain that corruption equals to monopoly plus discretion minus accountability plus transparency plus integrity. Monopoly here remain, uh, refers to the exclusive or sole power, while discretion refers to the arbitrary right to use or exercise those powers to decide in a particular situation. Obviously, a government functionary given exclusive power or undisputed powers together with the discretion to exercise those powers without proper guidelines, regulation or work procedure, or in the absence of access to information as to these work procedures, can be a law unto itself. You add this to a situation where there's no check and balance, lack of enforcement, coupled with personnel of low integrity, and you have a situation that is ripe, ripe for corruption. Looking at the equation, of course, you can't equate the problem of uh, corruption solely to the lack of disclosure. The reason is, it cannot be denied that uh, an individual, an individual public officer making a decision or taking action in the course of his duty, he may act in his private interest when he knows the public has no access to official records and information because he is protected by the OSA. But you can't attribute this corrupt behavior to the fact that there is restriction of information. This restriction of information protects or induces him to act otherwise, basically because he is also subject to yearly <coughs> audits. Government department itself is subjected to yearly audits by the Jabatan Audit Negara. And if there is a crime or information showing a crime, he can be investigated by the investigative authorities. Now, the real problem today is that when government functionaries cite the OSA to stifle public requests for disclosure, openness, transparency on decisions that appeared unjust or questionable, this inevitably lets lead to more accusation of cover-up of wrongdoing and some will conclude this reluctant as proof of wrongdoing. Now, on the other hand, we need to be mindful that uh, protecting confidential information may not always be about national interest, national security, but there are other considerations as well. This may include disclosure of official information. 
that may cause embarrassment or difficulties to the running of the government or government interests or even private interests, untimely disclosure or unauthorized leakages may benefit or prejudice, damage commercial interests that various parties have in the matter. So I believe we cannot dispute the need for the OSA, but arguments can be raised as to whether there is sufficient check and balances, whether there's any mechanism to provide access to information in circumstances where there may be a necessity in disclosure and where there is a good reason to disclose. Now, there are many uh, issues raised about the OSA. Among this, I just uh, recap, that there is no safeguard against unnecessary improper classification of government information, leading to ac accusation that the classification has extended beyond the need to protect government security or interests of the state. The provisions are said to be so general that anything connected with the government can be brought within its fold. The power to withhold information is not subject to judicial review, neither is there rules for periodic declassification or automatic release of information. Now, in the absence of public disclosure, coupled with cases of politicians, where incidents where politicians has been uh, charged for running foul of the law, the perception is the act has been used to go after whistleblowers or has been misused for the wrong reasons. Under the OSA, there are the defenses available for a person charged is quite limited. They include that the one, the information has not been properly classified, that is, it's not an official secret. Two, the dis disclosure was on a privileged occasion, such as parliamentary and judicial proceeding. Three, you need to show mens rea, which is a necessary ingredient of the friend, is, which is a necessary ingredient of the offense. A claim that, the, that you make the disclosure in public uh, interest or that the purpose of your disclosure was to expose corruption will not be a defense. Now, there is nothing com contained in the Official Secret Act that no civil or criminal proceeding shall lie against a public officer or against any person and no proceeding shall lie against such person thereof of the disclosure in good faith of any information or any part thereof or for any consequences that follow from that disclosure. As it is any unauthorized disclosure of official secrets which a person reasonably believes to show violation of a law, rule or regulation, mismanagement, gross waste of fun, fraud, abuse of authority or substantial or specific danger to public health is caught within the ambit of the act. Thus, a public officer cannot disclose to any person, including the press, information which he or she reasonably believe to show mismanagement, abuse of funds, without the risk of facing criminal prosecution. There is no provision to protect whistleblower. Now, where stand the MACC vis-a-vis -vis the OSA? The powers and uh, procedures of the MACC to investigate corruption offense is founded in the MACC Act 2009 as well as the Criminal Procedure Code. The MACC works through the help of informers, through the help of members of the public who have faith or trust in us. Now, under the MACC Act, there is a provision which states that any report made by a person where an officer of the commission, if you suspect the commission of offence, yeah, any report that is made by you to us shall be kept a secret. It shall not be disclosed to any other person until an accused person has been charged in court for an offence 
and the disclosure is made with the consent of the public prosecutor or the officer of the commission of the rank of commissioner and above. You see, you make a report to us, your report is not, the contents of the report that you are the complainant will not be disclosed until a person is charged in court or under specific circumstances with the uh, consent of the public prosecutor. Doesn't look good, right? Because you can still be exposed. So now, how do we deal with circumstances where there is a need for us to protect the source of the information, including the fact that the source may have come from, of, from uh, confidential information? Now, fortunately, again, there is certain provisions of, in our MACC Act where we can give you such protection. Now, if you have an information on an official secret, you want to pass it to the MACC. So the only way you can do it, of course, is you cannot lodge a report. Because when you lodge a report with us, you, your identity may be disclosed if a case comes to court or a person is charged. The only way we can, the MACC can help you to circumvent this is the MACC officer will lodge a report. This is called a covering report. For instance, I will lodge a report to the effect that information has been received without specifying who is the source of the information. Information has been received that on a certain date, certain time, okay, there was certain procurement that was made not in accordance with Treasury instruction and uh, certain parties were paid or has been compromised to facilitate this deal. So this covering report, only my name will appear. Your name will not be appear. Now, what happened when the case goes to trial? A person is charged. Again, there is a specific provision in our MACC Act that the information during the trial, the information referred in the complaint, the identity of the person from which such information is received, okay, the secret between the officer, that is me who made the report and your good self, okay, the circumstances the information was received shall not be disclosed or ordered to be disclosed in any civil, criminal, or other proceeding in court, tribunal, or authority. This specific protection is, protect, is provided for under Section 65, Subsection 1 of the MACC Act. Unless, unless, you see, the information is not given in good faith and is found to be false or false. Now, as to, the, uh, as to the investigation powers, the MACC Act provides us powers to compel the production of documents and properties. And these powers is not given. These powers, besides those powers that is given to the deputy public prosecutors, is given to the MACC officers. The only thing is that we cannot compel the product, uh, production of documents that is with the banks. That we need a, a specific order from the public prosecutor. But other than that, even if a document is an official secret act, we have the power to compel the production of the documents. Now, as it is, there is a, a specific provision again in our act that if we compel you to produce certain documents, Notwithstanding that the document that we compel you to produce you see, is an official secret, you are protected in our MACC Act that on account of such disclosure, which arises from a request or an order issued by an MACC officer, you shall not be prosecuted for any offense or by virtue of any contract or terms of employment, except for the offense of giving false evidence again, you know, giving a false statement. Okay. Now, I would like to conclude that is that the provisions of the Official Secret Act has not 
hinder us in the conduct of our investigation. But like I said, unnecessary secrecy can make the task of MACC in detecting suspected offences, suspected attempt to commit offences, or any suspected criminal conspiracy to commit offence more difficult and challenging, as it can impact upon our efforts to enlist and foster public support and confidence in fighting corruption. Thank you.